So a couple of weeks ago, we looked at aggregate polling data after a couple of polls indicated that Kamala Harris's numbers nationally were seemingly starting to stagnate a little bit. In fact, her national average actually declined, which was understandably alarming for some of my viewers, given how much is at stake in this election. But at the time, I told you all not to panic because her overall numbers weren't really that bad. And I told you all that we would revisit these polls in a couple of weeks. Well, guess what? That time has now come. And I'm here to say that I was right to tell you all to not panic because it's clear that Kamala Harris is back on top. And it's evident that she got a really nice post-debate polling bump. So I want to start with polling aggregators because two weeks ago when we looked at Real Clear Politics polling averages, her national lead was 1.3%. So it tightened a little bit. But now, two weeks later, she is up by, look at that, 2.1 points. That is a massive jump when we're talking about polling averages here. Now, when you look at the individual polls driving this surge, you'll see that she's reaching new highs in so many of these post-debate polls. Plus four in Yahoo, plus four in Data for Progress, plus five in Morning Consult, plus four in CBS News, plus six in Reuters, which is insane. Now, when it comes to that New York Times poll, she's actually gone down and she's tied with Donald Trump and she's also tied with him in Quinnipiac's poll. But it seems like the those polls appear to be outliers, at least when it comes to the national numbers. Now, we talked about this before, but RCP isn't my favorite aggregator because they do include a lot of junk pollsters. So I think that you can get a better picture of where things are at when you look at 538 or Silver Bulletin because they tend to include more reputable pollsters. So their average is going to be a lot more stable, which is why I like it. You're not going to see huge increases or decreases. Now, two weeks ago, a day before the debate, Harris had a 2.8 national lead in 538. Today, she's at 2.4. So she went down a little bit, but that's not that big of a decrease. Now, when you go to Nate Silver's Silver Bulletin, she's at 2.9 on average when she was at 2.4 a couple of weeks ago. So of all three polling aggregators that we use to gauge where the race is at, they all have Harris at about a two point plus lead over Donald Trump. And two of the three of them show that her lead actually increased, which is a great indication. Now, if you step back and you look at the bigger trend here, she's reclaimed her lead. And on top of that, she's gaining new highs in certain polls, which is either an indication that A, these new highs are just outliers, or B, there's actually real potential for growth. Now, when it comes to Donald Trump, the same can't be said. He's already hit his ceiling and there's not much room for growth, whereas these polls are indicating that there is a lot of room for growth with Kamala Harris. Now, the next thing to look out for is the debate between Tim Walls and J.D. Vance, because if Tim Walls is able to deliver a knockout blow in the same way that Harris did in her debate with Trump, we could see, once again, another bump for Harris, which is why the potential for growth here is so important. Now, even if J.D. Vance unexpectedly knocks it out of the park and does really well against Tim Walls, which I can't necessarily foresee, but let's say it happens, it's still hard to imagine imagine a pretty significant boost for Donald Trump because, again, he's kind of hit that ceiling. He's tapped out on the support, and it doesn't really seem like it's going to get that much better for him, which is why this potential for growth is so important. But we're just talking about national polls here, and of course, battleground states are the most important because that's going to be ultimately what decides the election. So, where is Harris at when it comes to swing states? Well, in Arizona, she is down by 2.2 points. In Nevada, she's up by 0.4. In Georgia, she's down by 2.1 points. In North Carolina, she's down by half a percentage point. In Wisconsin, she's up by one. In Michigan, she's up by 1.8. And in perhaps the most important state in this election, Pennsylvania, she's up by 0.6. So in the toss-up states, obviously it's not as rosy of a picture as it is nationally, but it's still really close. And we're seeing this weird phenomenon where Kamala Harris is reaching new highs in national polls, but she's not gaining as much ground in these toss-up states. The question is, why? Well, I think that the answer is obvious. Donald Trump is campaigning in those states and countering her messaging. So if you're an undecided voter in, say, Washington state and you tune into the debate and you like what you see and you decide, you know what, I'm going to support Harris, you're likely going to continue supporting her throughout the election because there's not going to be a push from Trump in your state since he knows it leans Democrat and it doesn't make sense to invest in Washington state. However, people in swing states are seemingly more fickle since they're bombarded with contradictory and counter messages from both campaigns. So if somebody in Pennsylvania, for example, sees Harris's performance at the debate and they really like her, well, 
Their opinion could change over time as they see more pro-Trump ads or they get reached out to by the Trump campaign. And we're facing a situation where Trump is leading in the Sun Belt states while Harris has the edge in Rust Belt states. Now, that might be worrying, but there's actually still cause for optimism. First of all, North Carolina really is in play for Harris. And there, the GOP governor's campaign, the Republican, just imploded. That could suppress GOP turnout in that state for Donald Trump and put Harris over the edge. Furthermore, when you move away from Harris and Trump and you just focus on Senate Democrats running against Republicans, there's some really interesting things happening. For example, Colin Allred, the Democratic Party Senate candidate in the state of Texas, is actually leading Ted Cruz by one point, according to a morning consult poll. In fact, Democrats are doing good across the board in their Senate races in that same poll. For example, they're all ahead of their Republican opponents massively in the Rust Belt. But if you look at states like Nevada and Arizona, where Harris is nearly ahead and behind, respectively, the Democratic Senate candidates are absolutely crushing their GOP opponents. Now, to be clear, that does not mean that Harris will definitely win the state if the Democratic Party Senate candidate carries the state, but it is possible that Harris benefits from the enthusiasm for those candidates if this poll is correct. Now, usually it's the other way around where the candidate at the top of the ticket affects down ballot races, and that's certainly true, but I think that Ticket splitting in this day and age is very unusual because of how polarized we are. So if these Democrats pull off victories in these states, which is looking likely according to polling data, it's much more likely that Harris carries those states too, right? Now, aside from head-to-head -head polling data, there's other factors at play that work in Harris's favor. One of them is that her favorability has sharply increased. In fact, it surge in a way that's actually very surprising in this day and age. Steve Kornacki of MSNBC is going to explain what her numbers look like from their poll. The view, the overall perception of Kamala Harris, remember before she got in the race, a lot of talk that, you know, her numbers didn't look better than Biden's. She was 32 positive, 50 negative before getting in this race. And now this is what you see. And we have to pause here because this is the largest increase that we have seen for any politician since George W. Bush in the wake of the September 11th attacks on yeah, this issue. Yeah, absolutely, Kristen. I mean, we were seeing numbers like this for years for Kamala Harris. Now you're seeing a very different story. And what goes into that, that new uh, uh, level of, uh, of uh, popularity she has? Take a look here, if we can. There it is. Call this up here. Some of the groups that have gravitated the most towards Harris, just in terms of favorable, because black voters, 24-point increase, independents, 20, young voters, 26. Young voters, this is a group where Joe Biden, when he was still in, he was putting up very, very poor numbers for a Democrat with Harris. You could see a 26 point jump there in her favorable score uh, among voters under 30. Right at the end, before the clip cut out, you saw Tim Walls and his numbers. He was at plus seven. So he is very much still the most popular candidate in the race. But the fact that Kamala Harris's favorables have improved so much is a really good sign, obviously. And it's really shocking to see because typically in American politics, the more that a politician is visible, the more we tend to to hate them. But with Kamala Harris, the opposite is happening. The more that she is visible, the more that Americans like her. But then again, the campaign that she's running, her staffers don't seem to schedule as much interviews. So perhaps they think that putting her out there might sour Americans' opinions on her. I'm not necessarily sure either way. This is a good sign for Harris and could be an indication that she's being underestimated in polls because her likability may actually drive up turnout for people who don't typically vote. Now, that's not a guarantee, obviously. But it's certainly possible, although you do have to keep in mind that Trump also tends to turn out non-traditional voters as well. So this could be a question of who's going to bring out more non-voters, right? And that could determine the election. But the fact that her favorability has increased so much is nothing to scoff at. That's really huge, actually. Again, I cannot emphasize how much Americans are fed up with politicians. So the fact that she's going up and not down, really, really important sign. Now, I want to show you uh, Harry Anton's analysis because he's going to give us a little bit of insight into why this is happening, along with some details about this phenomenon. If you had asked me two months ago whether I thought Kamala Harris in the aggregate would ever during this campaign pop a positive net favorability rating, I would have said you were crazy. But the fact is you weren't crazy. I was just not thinking creatively. Kamala Harris has come into this campaign and the more voters have gotten a look at her, the more they have liked her. 
It's interesting. Now compare her standing to the last two presidents when it comes to favorability. Yeah. So, you know, the idea that you would have a candidate at this point in this environment having a net positive oh. favorability rating is part of the reason why I didn't think it was possible was because look at Donald Trump's net favorability rating. This is actually higher than he was in the last two campaigns at this point, but still underwater at minus nine points. Joe Biden at minus 14 points here. And this, I think, Harris's initial net favorability rating was kind of tracking with Biden's right because she was the vice president. But as she has gone and out on the campaign trail and become her own candidate, she has been able to pop this net positive favorability rating. And she is the only one of these three who are in positive territory, Sarah. You just mentioned this, but it sounds like this negative 14 points was also what she had before. So they saw them as a as a team, as they should. Correct. She was being judged on what Biden had been doing and Correct. what the economy was like, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Is there any sign that another Democrat, because there's this always this, you know, is this some, would someone else do better? Yeah. What is the polling tell? So you? this to me is a great data point because it just sort of gets mm. at the idea that maybe Kamala Harris is actually slightly outperforming what a generic Democrat would be doing. So we have the generic House ballot here, Democrat versus Republican, and we see that the Democrats lead on that generic ballot by a point. Right now in the national popular vote polls, we see Kamala Harris up by three points. So she is actually outperforming slightly, but still is outperforming the generic House Democrat. So this to me is an idea that as she has gone on the campaign trail, she's not just met sort of the generic benchmark, she's actually doing slightly better than the generic benchmark, which kind of goes into this whole thing that maybe Kamala Harris and her campaign know what they're doing, despite the fact that folks don't like the economy. And I think that's part of what's keeping this campaign close. Mm -hmm. Folks remember what they believe was a good economy under Donald Trump. That's keeping things close. But Kamala Harris has taken the ball and run with it and turned a campaign that Donald Trump was leading against Joe Biden and turned it into quite a competitive one, one in which he has a real shot of winning. Again, I cannot overstate how impressive this is. And it speaks to why there's so much potential for growth for Kamala Harris. Now, I do want to go back to the infamous New York Times and Siena College poll that has a lot of people worried, rightfully so. I mean, this is a really accurate pollster. So if they say that Harris is tied nationally with Donald Trump, that is a little bit alarming. But here's the thing. The poll isn't going to be decided based on the popular vote. And while I think that it's likely that Harris will win the popular vote, we don't know what's going to happen with the Electoral College. But it's conceivable that Harris actually loses the, the national vote but wins the Electoral College and you win the election. I think that that's unlikely. But the reason why I don't think there should be as much concern about the New York Times poll is because when you zoom in and you look at a key state like Pennsylvania, well, even though they show Harris tied with Trump, in Pennsylvania, they have Harris ahead by four points. Four points in the must-win state of Pennsylvania. Whoever wins Pennsylvania has a very, very solid chance of winning the entire election. Now, Harry Ensign is going to explain why this is so important, and he's going to compare her numbers to Biden's numbers in 2020, and that is going to give us a lot of insight into what may be happening. What we see here now is a four-point advantage for Kamala Harris over Donald Trump. You look last month, it was the exact same thing. So you're seeing consistency among the New York Times Siena College poll. Why is that so important to me? Because given the sort of controversy around polling over the last few years, I want to look at the pollsters who have been most accurate. And if you look at the New York Times Siena College poll back in the 2022 Senate race, what you saw was the result was John Fetterman, the Democrat, by five points. And the final New York Times Siena College poll had John Fetterman ahead by five points. So a very accurate pollster back in 2022 showing a consistent small but consistent advantage for Kamala Harris in the state that might prove to be the most pivotal. So we've talked a lot about all this new swing state polling that's come out in the last 24 hours. There are a couple polls from not really swing states, but polls that I think you think tell an important story. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that was so notable about the New York Times poll was Harris was ahead by five in a state that Joe Biden only won by one point. So an overperformance, she's outperforming Biden's margin by three points. And let's take a look at some other pollsters who not just got 2022 right, but who got 2020 right, which a lot of pollsters did not. So let's go to Iowa, right? Ann Sells are one of the best pollsters in the business. You go back to her final poll in 2020, she had Donald Trump ahead by seven points. He ended up winning in Iowa by eight. Look at where she has the race right now, a poll that was released just on Sunday. Donald Trump ahead, but just by four. So Kamala Harris is doing three points better than Joe Biden did in the final poll back in 2020. How about in New Hampshire, the UNH poll? Again, this poll was within a point, the final one in 2020. It had Joe Biden winning by eight in the 
uh, Granite State, he won by seven. Look at where Kamala Harris is ahead by. She's ahead by 11 points. So a three-point overperformance, again, the same as we saw in Iowa, the same that we see in New Hampshire, very consistent with the three-point overperformance that we see, or the four-point overperformance, the three-point overperformance that we see in, of course, Pennsylvania in terms of the New York Times Siena College Bowl versus the 2020 results. Always looking for trends. I think that's what you're doing and that's why this is all important and why we appreciate the lessons you give us. Talk to us about the difference between some of these northern swing states and the southern ones. Right. So these are all northern states, right? New Hampshire, Iowa, and of course Pennsylvania. And so if we right now look Harris versus Trump in the battlegrounds margin, you look in the northern battlegrounds, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, what we see is Harris up by three. If you look in the Sun Belt battleground states, Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and North Carolina, we see a tide race. So Harris doing better in those northern battleground states than she's doing in those southern battleground states. And again, John, so pivotal, the electoral map, the race to 270. Even if Harris loses, say in North Carolina and Georgia, and then in Nevada and Arizona, if she carries these Great Lake battleground states up here, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, that gets her to exactly 270 electoral votes. So the bottom line is this good polling for Kamala Harris in these northern battleground states may be just enough to get her over the top in the electoral college. It is a path to 200. It is a path. And that's a really important point because when it comes to battleground states, it's not like she has to win all of them to hit 270. In fact, I think it's very likely that she doesn't win all of them, right? But what he laid out there was just one path to victory, but it's important to keep in mind that Harris has multiple paths to victory. If she manages to pick up North Carolina, for example, she has even more paths to victory. That opens a lot of doors because then she can afford to lose Sunbelt states. She can afford to lose the Sunbelt states and a Rust Belt state, for example, depending on which one. So if it's the case that she does pick up North Carolina and her overperforming Biden is any indication, I'd say that she's in pretty good shape and she might actually be underestimated by the polls, although Trump does tend to be underestimated by the polls as well. So there's so many variables here and you can't say for sure. And I don't I don't want to minimize the fact that this is going to be a very close race, even though it shouldn't be. But right now, I think it looks good for Harris, right? I'm not going to make a prediction because a lot can change between now and November. And I am not good at predictions and I don't think it's helpful to make predictions, but it's a close race. But there's a lot going for Harris, which is something that I think we should all keep in mind. But what I want to do is we will revisit this again after the vice presidential debate, which is gonna take place on October 1st, and about a week or so after that, then we'll be able to gauge whether or not that moved the needle in either direction. But in conclusion, this is going to be a very tight race. I can't foresee that changing between now and November. It's gonna be a tight race. But Harris has a lot working in her favor, and I think that that's definitely cause for optimism and not doomerism. But what matters is that you actually go out and vote, because if you become demoralized and you think that a certain outcome is already inevitable, then you know that's how you can kind of make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. So don't do that. Stay engaged and make sure that you don't get too doomer, because it's not all that bad. It's close, which is depressing, but nonetheless, it's looking pretty good for Harris right now. It's close, but it's good. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? Tree, tree, tree. Tree. <laughs> tree. They not like us. Tree. Tree. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? tree.